in today's show. We recap a pretty crazy Sunday in the NBA. We're going to do what, We're going to do our request elaboration as well. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at redrock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. A lot of stuff to talk about today. I'm not going to waste any time. There's only five games. Doesn't mean we've got, doesn't know, yeah, try again. It doesn't mean we don't have plenty to talk about. Let's get into the news. Um, Luke Walton, fired. Is it about time? Absolutely it is. I have mixed thoughts on this, and I'll tell you what the mixed thoughts are. Um, Look, Luke Walton should never have been hired to begin with. Luke Walton should have been fired after year one. Luke Walton should have been fired after year two. I don't think there's any real argument you could make against any of those thoughts. You can, you can make your arguments. I'm not going to buy them, but you could make your arguments that, that that's yeah, that that's not true. It is true. He should have been fired uh, straight away. He shouldn't have been hired. Should have been fired straight away. All right. Is it right that he's fired now? Absolutely, based on performance. It made no sense. But my problem with the Kings is, I don't want Luke Walton out of a job. Like, you know, I, I, I don't want people losing their jobs, but he, this is not his role. He needs to be an assistant coach somewhere. The problem is, this is why, why bring the guy back through the off-season, give him another chance of 17 games so that you have to... His system is working through preseason. It's his coaching staff. It's his rotate. All that stuff. You have you don't have a new coach that comes in and that can bring that stuff in. In the off-season, you wait 17 games. Ludicrous. Ludicrous stuff. You haven't saved... How much extra money have you saved by waiting three months here to fire him? That's the thing that's stupid. I suppose the argument against that is you could say, well, you know, better late than never, or why wait any longer? And I agree with all that. And I can't go back and change, change time. They can't go back and say, well, we'll go back in time and fire him in June or May. Like they can't do that. They should have, but the fact that they waited this long is just another in a long line of screw ups from this dysfunctional franchise. I feel sorry for Kings fans. I don't know if it's on Monty McNair or if it's your mate Vivek. You know doing bullshit stuff behind the scenes. I'm going to lean probably towards the ladder there. Just consistent, ridiculous stuff from this Kings franchise. Walton was not an NBA head coach. He did not deserve to be a head coach. He should not have coached this season. But that decision needed to be made ages ago, at least in the off season, not now. Now, the question that every fantasy person has is, oh, what does this mean? Who's the ad? Multiple people. Do I go and add Marvin Bagley now? Luke Walton wasn't Marvin Bagley's problem. Let's be clear. Luke Walton was not holding Marvin Bagley back. In fact, I would say Luke Walton played Marvin Bagley too much in his first three seasons. And I think some of that was front office stuff. And I'm sure him not playing now is not Walton going against the wishes of the franchise. It wouldn't have been him going, Monty, I know I'm on thin ice, but can I tell the number two overall pick from three years ago that you know, the previous regime screwed up? I'm going to tell him to go fuck himself. Yeah, no worries. No, nah, no, Luke, we disagree with that vehemently, but you're a coach with such solid footing that you can go and do that. There is no way that that happened. So it's not like, I don't think a new coach is coming in and saying, Marvin, we figured out the problem. It was Luke, not you all along. Here's 30 minutes, go sick. Maybe I'm wrong on this and maybe Bagley will come in and they'll start him and he'll put up huge numbers. I doubt it. I just don't think it was Luke Walton holding him back. Does this help unlock Darren Fox? Maybe, I don't know. Fox's problem seems to be the shots aren't going and not necessarily Walton, although the offense is horrible. Um, does this mean more consistent minutes for Rashawn Holmes? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that it does, but I don't know. Elvin Gentry, don't get me wrong. I had plenty of shit things to say about him as a coach. He was not particularly good in New Orleans. Go back to one of his comments about you know, Drew Holiday, how it was easier for him to play him more minutes if you brought him off the bench versus starting him. There's one that just comes to mind. He was not a particularly good coach, Elvin. And 
you know, that's the problem with firing Walton now is that you just go, well, Elvin's here. We'll just make him the, the, the coach versus having a proper um, procedure where you could have got your hands on Wes Unsell Jr. perhaps, who's doing a pretty good job. Jamal Mosley, who's doing a pretty good job in Orlando. Maybe not so much Chauncey Billups, but you would have had your pick of whoever you wanted, really. And like, you wouldn't have had your pick, but you could have at least got interviews with a bunch of guys. Could have brought in Mike D'Antoni for all I care. Like, there's lots of guys that could have been brought in here. Um, but now you're just stuck with a guy that you've got as the assistant coach. Assistant coaches don't normally make gigantic changes to things, especially initially when they're brought in to replace a fired head coach. So I wouldn't be expecting gigantic changes. Maybe you get a small bump in pace. Maybe you get a little bit more consistency with Holmes and that Len Thompson backup center mirror go around, get some stability. Maybe Heald does end up starting over Metu. I don't know. But I wouldn't be making significant fantasy moves under the assumption that Alvin Gentry is going to just fix everything, really. I wouldn't be, um, yeah, I wouldn't be running through all, all those sort of things in my mind, thinking, well, this is all going to unlock all this. It happens every time that someone gets, um, a coach gets fired, that people always rush. Well, now this is going to change and this is going to change. And it, it generally isn't that. Um, Frank Kaminsky's out indefinitely with a stress reaction in his knee. He wasn't going to play anyway, outside of like three or four minutes a night. He was the third center. He played well when Aiton was out, but don't worry about, um, like he wasn't, it doesn't, doesn't change much in the Suns rotation. Jared Allen and Larry Markkinen look like they'll be back on Monday, so that's good news. Nick Batum is out at least 10 days in health and safety protocols, and if he's out 10 days, I think you can consider him as a droppable player. Nick Claxton, with whatever this illness is, he's out for at least two more weeks. Man, this must be something pretty significant. It's not COVID. He's been out for ages. It's going to be a month-long absence for an illness. Hopefully, he's all right. Bruce Brown Jr., more on net stuff. He's out for the next game at least with a hamstring injury. You would think that that's going to be a couple more games there. That opens up Bembry and Mills and even James Johnson for a little bit more um, extra playing time there. And it looks like Clay Thompson's Christmas return is on. We're six weeks away from that, or maybe a bit less than six weeks. Again, Clay will return. He'll play limited minutes. He'll be on a minutes restriction, a back-to-back restriction, I would imagine, for the first month, maybe three weeks. And maybe you're getting full speed Clay by February. I I think back-to-backs last all season, to be honest. Um, And then minutes restriction maybe for the first month. So don't have too high um, expectations of, uh, of Clay Thompson as he comes back into action. But you should have high expectations for prize picks because it is the best NBA DFS prop game out there. I love it, and I know you're going to love it as well. It's Daily Fantasy Made Easy. It is the best NBA DFS prop game out on the market. It's not just the superstars. They've got the bench guys even playing limited minutes. So those of you who want to get your Luca Garza props in, you can do it over on Price Picks. Points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals, threes, fantasy points, whatever you can think of, Price Picks has that. And to get an entry together, get four to five guys, pick their individual over under prop projections, put them together, pick your side, and there you go. You can win up to 10 times your entry fee. And if you sign up using the promo code NBA, you can get a 100% match deposit bonus up to 100 bucks. Entries can be done in under 60 seconds and withdrawals are safe and fast. So head to pricepicks.com, use the promo code NBA, or go to your app store and download the app, or download the app today. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. This will sound like a familiar problem. You've got your live sports you watch on one device. You've got your on-demand shows you watch somewhere else. You've got your highlights you watch on your phone. And then you have your neighbors log in for the other stuff. It's just too much. It's too much of a, of a uh, schmuzzle. It's too much of confusion. It's just too many things. I'm going to tell you about a way you can get everything you love, all that entertainment together in one place. Finally, get your TV together. It is called Direct TV Stream. It brings your live TV and on-demand favorites in one place like never before. So you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there is no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required and content varies by package. Let's go back in and have a look. Oh, so we've looked at all the news. What am I doing? All right, we have looked at, at all the news there. So what it is time for now is uh, it's time for I Request Elaboration. I Request Elaboration. We're going to look at Darren Fox. He ties in with the King stuff. Because um, let's let's be honest, he was um, well, he has been struggling this season. Over the last two weeks, he's the 82nd ranked player. But in points leagues, it's important to note, He's averaging 37 fantasy points on Yahoo Points Leagues, which makes him 33rd. So while we look at the struggles that Darren Fox had, where he was outside the top 170 to begin this season, it's not the case anymore. 
He's into 116 for the year. 82nd here overall, averaging 22 points, 1.3 triples, 2.3 rebounds, which is anemic, 5 assists, 1.3 steals, and a block in 34 minutes, shooting 46, 35, and 71. They're not bad numbers. All right, 46, 35, and 71 are not bad numbers. This does not deflect from the fact that to begin this season, yeah, he was really poor. I don't think anybody would deny that. Um, in terms of Raptor on this team, Raptor, the 538 all-in-one metric, He's dead last in players uh, qualifying in terms of minutes. And the current cutoff they use is 219 minutes play that changes every day. He's last in Raptor, negative 4.0, mainly because of how bad his defense has been. He's a negative in terms of wins added based on uh, above replacement on Raptor. That's really bad. He's last in on-off, according to Clean the Glass, negative 7.4, which in the 24th percentile in the NBA. Again, that's bad. He's 61st in a 61st percentile on EPM, which isn't as bad as some of those other metrics, but still not ideal. And he's 141st in daily plus minus on Darko. And he's been one of the worst in terms of improvement. 476. So his Darko DPM, which does project forward, it's dropped off significantly. Last year, in terms of his EPM, he was 86th percentile. He's 61st this year. It's dropped way off. And one of the things that's really intriguing to me is looking at his... Um, some of his stats over on Darko, where he had, yeah, his Darko peaked right at the start of the 18-19 season. And since then, it's almost been in constant decline. And now it's sort of hovering right around zero, making him like, like an average player for about the last two years. That's somewhat of a concern, I would say, for Fox. Now, he can be better than this, for sure. I don't think anybody would doubt that. Um, but it just, it isn't looking good at the moment. So what's off with him? Well, he's shooting at career-worst numbers at the rim, just 60%. His three-point shooting is atrocious. Now, it's never good, but he's at 25% overall from there. Mid-round, mid-range shooting is about the same. He's at 42% on his mids, but 25% on threes. Now, this is a guy that's had a 37% season. He's had a couple of 30 ones, never won under 30. That's probably the biggest thing that is hurting is the fact that his three-pointers are just way off. He's also taking um, a lot more mid-rangers, which is always going to be a concern. He's in the 93rd percentile on short mid-rangers and the 88th percentile on um, all mid-rangers. So he's taking a lot of mid-range shots. He's also His attempts at the rim are also down, but in terms of where that rates with the league, it's actually higher. So he was at 33% shots at the rim last year. He's at 30 this season. But in terms of where that lands in the league, he's actually getting to the rim a little bit more than um, his uh, compatriots. He was 71st, 71st this year and 66th percentile last year. So he's getting to the rim more relatively to the rest of the league, but down down from where it was in the past as he is settling for a lot more mid-ranges there, taking a lot more mid-ranges than he was last season. And his three-point numbers are well, well down, 22% only of his threes coming from outside the arc. So that is a, a bit of a concern. The fact that he's not hitting threes, he's reverting to mid-ranges, which is not the ideal shot attempt. And he's not getting to the rim as much, even though he's still getting there at a decent amount um, uh, relatively to his compatriots. I still think that Darren Fox can improve from where he is at the moment. But the last you know, seven games, 22 with five assists, the only thing that really stands out to me there and 1.3 steals is... The five assists could maybe be seven. The steals could go from 1.3 to 1.6, but the scoring, the free throw percentage, the field goal percentage, the three-point percentage, I don't think you can hope for too much more than that, to be honest. 34% from three, 49 from two. He can be a 50% two-point guy, yeah, sure. If he cuts some of the mid-ranges out and gets to the rim more, that's probably the change. So I still think he is a bit of a buy low, but we hoped that he would take a big step forward this year. And I don't really have that faith in him anymore. I think he can get back to where he was last year. But taking a big step forward, I don't know. I'm losing a bit, bit of faith in him being able to um, do that. It is now time for Watfo. We did have a winner in one of my Watfos, which someone asked. So I'm not gonna, we're going to recap them all at the end of the year, but I'll, I'll let you know what this one was. It was, um, what are the chances, what are the odds that Dwayne Casey is the first coach fired? And I said it was 5% chance. So I win that one pretty comfortably because obviously Luke Walton is gone. Um, so yeah, win that one. Nice little uh, nice little boost to my overall score on on that one for Watfo. But this one comes from Tyler Isaac. He says, what is the what are the odds that Mo Bamba averages more blocks than Anthony Davis this season? And this is a really, really tough one to me. Bumba is in the position where we just don't know where his minutes are going to go. When John Isaac returns, does he say at 30 minutes a night? Or does he move down to 24 minutes a night? Yeah, that 
that's really the question here because Bamba currently is averaging 2.2 blocks. Anthony Davis is averaging, if I can find it, 2.3. So Davis is ahead. I do think that I do think that there is a chance that Bamba can maintain 2.2 while Davis maybe goes down to 2.1 and that's going to make it really close. So I'm sort of on the fence. I am going to lead Bamba and go 60% chance that he leads or he has more uh, average blocks this season than Anthony Davis. We'll see where that one ends up. But where Bilt Bar ends up is right in the middle of your Thanksgiving table because Thanksgiving is about family. But it's about food as well. And unfortunately, so much of the food, especially the dessert, is high in calories and high in sugar. Built Bar is neither of those things. Built Bar is the low-calorie, low-carb, low-sugar, low-fat, high-protein protein bar that can be your new dessert alternative. And it is covered in 100% chocolate. So the flavors are there. Coconut cream pie, bang. Coconut Built Bar. Raspberry cream pie, bang. Raspberry Built Bar. Delicious stuff. And you can get them at a discount. Head to Built.com. You can use the promo code LOCK15 to save 15%. There's going to be Black Friday deals as well. There's plenty of new flavors that keep coming out as well. There's a vanilla cream that just got released. There's a cherry lime that got released. There's a blueberry muffin that got released. Some great flavors there as well. So head to Built.com. Use that code LOCKED15 and you can save 15% off Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar ever. That'll take us now into the game recaps for, uh, for Sunday. The first one of those was the early game. We're looking at the uh, Dallas Mavericks and the Los Angeles Clippers. Not really much of a barn burner in terms of the score here. Really, really low scoring. Pretty ugly game, in fact. Um, the Clippers win it 97 to 91. For Dallas, there was no Luka Doncic. So, Porzingis. Porzingis. Another big game. 25 and 8 with two blocks. He's the 13th ranked player over the last two weeks. He's dominating. Um, he is. Hold on to yourselves. He's 21st this season on a per game basis. This is why, you know, people hate the bloke. Whenever he gets injured, you always throw a buy low because people will look, oh, I'm going to drop him. I can't with this bloke. I'm going to drop him. All right, calm down. Um, he's put out big numbers. And it's, some of it is with Doncic. Some of it is without Doncic, which is important. Brunson was great. 20 points, eight assists, three steals. He needs to be on a roster. 43 fantasy points for him as well. He is a sell high. You're just not going to be able to do it because everyone's going to recognize why he's performing at this level. So I'd rather just ride out the increased production and then drop it off later on. But I don't know exactly what to do with Tim Hardaway. In fact, maybe Jack... Get that garbage out of here! Despite having no Luka Doncic, like he's still not really elevating. Eight points on 17%. He had five assists, six rebounds. He's 185th over the last two weeks. He's 174th for the season. It is true that finding points can be hard off the waiver wire, uh, finding uh, uh, bulk points, but... Is that enough to keep him rostered when he's not really helping in many other areas and he's hurting your field goal percentage so much? I think it's a question that you do need to consider whether that is, you know, whether he is the guy for you. Maxi Kleber returned five points with a block in 20 minutes while Reggie Bullock went scoreless in 32 minutes. He has been an absolutely horrible free agent signing. I thought it was a pretty solid move and he just has been shocking, like absolutely really bad. Dwight Powell had nine and five in 19 minutes. His minutes came down with uh, Kleber back, while Finney Smith had seven points in his 24 minutes. Onto the Clippers. As I said, Batum is in the COVID protocol, so that's at least 10 days. So they started um, the old Fuick himself, Amir Coffey. Three points in 25 minutes for the Farmers Union. He is only the very, very deepest of league ads while Batum is out. Paulie George had 29 in 38 minutes, and Reggie Jackson had 23 in 35. Good production for both of those blokes. While with Batum and Morris out, Luke Kennard played 34. Nine points, three threes, two steals, and a block. And he has at least short-term value as a 12, if not 14-team league guy. Serge Ibaka was back from the G League. He played 12 minutes. Unfortunately, that meant the end of Isaiah Hartenstein. Hartenstein is still insanely productive. And by insanely productive, I mean he had two points, two rebounds, a steal, and a block. But it came in five minutes. He's just an absolutely gigantic permanent player. But if you did decide to stream him for 12 or 14-team leagues, you can move on. Zubats played 27 minutes, had 16 and 10, but not much else. How the Zubats Ibaka minutes work will be really intriguing as we move forward. While well, Terrence Mann, another stinker. Seven points in 27 minutes. I just don't think it's worth holding on to him in 12 team formats. It's getting close to that for Eric Bledsoe as well. He's very up and down. Two points in 26 minutes with four rebounds and two assists. I'd like to hold on a little bit more with Batum out, but man, it's uh, it's going pretty rough at this point. And just again, quickly, Serge Ibaka, don't worry about adding him in 12-team formats. The next game of the day. Hit the wrong button then. Let's hit it again because I just hit the wrong one. Um, the Lakers, the Pistons. The Lakers get the win. 
121-116. The Pistons were up huge in this one. They absolutely choked it away. But let's talk about the big incident with LeBron James getting ejected for a flagrant two foul for contact on Isaiah Stewart. Now, people are always going to have insane reactions to things that I say or that anyone says, really. Oh, you just hate the Lakers. You hate LeBron. Literally, LeBron, I have marginally as the number one player of all time. I don't hate the bloke at all. All right, not at all. But that doesn't preclude me from saying what he did was wrong. He deserves a suspension. I had people tell me, nah, Isaiah Stewart shouldn't have held his arm. That's dirty. Like, kids, are, like, are you fucking kidding me? Holding someone's arm is dirty. It is not dirty in the slightest. And when you go watch the thing, he wasn't actually holding his arm. He had his forearm pressed into LeBron's side to push him off on the box out. LeBron's arm was on top of Isaiah Stewart's arm. They weren't locked in. LeBron was sitting on top. He turned his head with a clenched fist and swung his arm back and punched him in the eye. That's what happened. It wasn't even an elbow. It wasn't an inadvertent elbow. It was a closed fist that hit him in the eye and cut him open. That, to me, is a bad play. It's a dirty play from LeBron. And he deserved to get ejected and he deserves to get suspended for it. It doesn't say anything about LeBron or the Lakers or anything like that. It's just a bad play. He was not locked up and just trying to free his arm. His arm was literally on top of Stewart's, not under, not engaged. It was on top of it and swung and pushed and tried to get him off. And when you swing a closed fist and you hit someone in the head, that's called a, a punch, my guy. I don't care if you meant to split his eye open or not. You punched him in the head. Simple as that. You're done. You're suspended. It has to be. Now, on Isaiah Stewart, the way he reacted was was ridiculous to me. Now, if you get whacked in the head and you go down, you get up and you want to remonstrate with someone, absolutely, no worries. Remonstrate away, grab him, push him over, whatever you need to do. If you need to give him a jumpery, whatever you need to do, you need to bump into him, smash him down, do whatever. But the fact that he got up, was like standing there calm and then started sprinting like a maniac, that was like calculated craziness. I don't know what was going on with that. That, that deserves a suspension as well. It's all well and good to get up in the heat of the moment and remonstrate on, on an incident. But to get up, you know, be looked at and they go, oh, I've got blood and then charge charge like a crazy person through the court, that was that's not on. Like that's the sort of stuff that I, I don't think needs to well, you don't you don't need that in the NBA. You don't need that in any sport. That just it looked ridiculous. So I think both guys need I think both guys are, are at fault here. Actually, that's not true. Let me try again. Isaiah Stewart's not at fault for getting hit in the face. He did nothing to deserve getting hit in the face. But he will, I think, cop some sort of uh, punishment because of the exaggerated reaction towards the end again if you get if he get knocked in the head and he gets back up and grabs lebron throttles him a bit whatever i don't think there's no any problem with that. that is totally justified but it's the way that he went down got up was calm and standing, and then like you know what 30 seconds or a minute later however long it was then started charging like a crazy person that's the problem to me that's what you get that's what you get a suspension for not a remonstration after the uh, after the event i'm sure you're going to have plenty of opinions on this and tell me that I'm crazy and it wasn't intentional and this is what happens in basketball and whatever you want to say. I'm sure people are going to say it. But LeBron, closed fist, wasn't tied up, hit him in the eye, should be suspended. Stewart's reaction at the end, not not on. That, that's how I see it. Let me know what you think. And there you go. As for the rest of the game, Tone Davis, 40 minutes, 30 and 10, 6 assists, 4 steals, 5 blocks. Just an absolutely gigantic performance. Westbrook was also pretty good in this one, despite the percentages, or sorry, despite the free throw percentages. 26, 9, and 10 with two steals, 48 from the field. I thought him and Davis really clicked in that last quarter. Um, and Carmelo Anthony had 18 points in 30 minutes. They also went absolutely insanely back to starting DeAndre Jordan and playing him 13 minutes. For what reason? I have no idea. You start Taylor Horton Tucker two games and then bring him off the bench. Why is Jordan even playing? It's just not necessary. Horton Tucker ended up with 33 minutes. The shooting was horrible. 8, 6, and 3 with a steal. But it's very hard to understand what we're going to do here with Horton Tucker because, again, LeBron didn't play half this game. So I'd like to hold THT probably two more. LeBron will be suspended one and then see what happens in the next game to see how he's used and what the rotation and what the minutes are alongside actually a full game of LeBron James. Avery Bradley continues to be one of the most non-impactful starters in the NBA. Zero points in 26 minutes for him. He does not deserve to be on any single fantasy team anywhere. But the Pistons. I thought Cade Cunningham played well. With a caveat. I don't know what happened in the fourth quarter. 13, 12, and 10 is great. First triple-double. 29% shooting is horrific. 11% from three is dreadful. But he didn't take a shot, a single shot in the fourth quarter until there was about two or three minutes left. And then he got blocked twice in a row by Anthony Davis. Like, that was frustrating. Part of that's on him. A large part is on his dickhead in the suit on the side, Dwayne Casey, just not putting the ball in his hands. Like, that 
that play at the end to try and get a game-tying three. Give the ball to Cade and let him try and figure it out. Not this, whatever they were trying to do, we're going to lob it inside the two-point arc so the guy can then throw it back out and you just throw it straight to Davis. Like, just get it to Cade and let him try and figure something out. The fact that Jeremy Grant was taking ISO long twos and that app bloke, I mean, he's unbelievably frustrating to watch Jeremy Grant. Like, it's so painful to watch him play. The long two ISOs that he was doing were, were crazy. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. Um, Jeremy Grant, ended, he, look, he ended with 36 points. That's great. But he also took 25 shots. He was 7 of 10 from line. And just some of his absolute ton of, tunnel vision was infuriating. Uh, MC Hamadou Diallo. If, oh, I can't find the thing. Where's my MC Hamadou? Oh, no. This is a disaster. Anyway, can't touch this. There you go. Uh, 17 and 6, 2 steals and a block. Now, that is on really high efficiency, 78%. That's not real. The 21 minutes is fine, but that's likely because Killian Hayes was out. He has obviously overtaken Josh Jackson, but don't look to add him in 12 or 14 team leagues after this. Frank Jackson had 15 in 26 minutes. He's just a streamer for deeper leagues. While Corey Joseph did his best, Killian Hayes with 39 minutes, 5 points and 7 assists. If Hayes misses more time, then um, Joseph can be a short-term streamer. Elf Stewart, hard to judge. 19 minutes, 4 points. That's not great. But, of course, he was ejected. And then the depressed penis had another disappointing night, 14-4-2 for Bay. He still remains a 12-team league guy, but I just I don't, I don't see it with him. I don't see him developing into a very good long-term player. All right, let's go on to the next game, the Knicks and the Bulls. The Bulls win it 109-106. The double royal, Julius Randle. been a rough goal things from Randall before this game he was the 137th ranked player over the last two weeks but 34 and 10 is excellent on unbelievably good percentages so hopefully we can get him kick started but it was the same story for the rest of the, of the starters shithouse once again Kemba Walker played only 18 minutes hello Jack Armstrong says get that garbage out of here I just think you have to move on now you just got to go with someone else um Rowan Barrett he did have 15 points RJ but 17 percent shooting Two rebounds, one assist, one steal. Is he going to get Jack Armstrong? It bloody feels like it. He's the 300th ranked player over the last two weeks. Get that garbage out of here! In a points league, I'd be more inclined to keep him. In a 12-team category league, he's on the fence. 10-team, he can go. Like, he's just, over years and years and years, has shown that he's not a good fantasy player for category leagues. Never been a top 100 guy. Not looking like it now. He will be much better than this. I know he's going to improve. So if you do want to hold in 12 teams, I don't think it's the wrong decision. But it's also not wrong to move on. Um, I think Ivan Fournier, the disease scrotum, him. Three points in 23 minutes. Jack? Jack? Get that garbage out of here! Yeah, just shit house again. But at least we got 29 minutes of Alec Burks, who's playing well. 30 minutes of Derek Rose. 13 points for Burks. Nine for Rose with a steal and three blocks for Derek Rose. And we got 25 minutes of Emmanuel quickly. I think you can look at Burks and Rose as at least short-term 12-team league guys while we're trying to figure out what the hell this rotation is. Quickly is more of a 14-team league guy, but he's a top 120 player, Emmanuel, over the last two weeks. Nerland's Noel played 26 minutes. He had three blocks. If you need steals and blocks, this is the guy. That makes him a must-roster guy. It doesn't mean it has to be on your roster. It just means that he should be on someone's roster in a 12-team league because he's going to produce these numbers. Mitch Robinson's in the concussion protocol, so we don't know how long it's going to be until he returns. But Noel has got a great opportunity here. I thought uh, Obi Toppin did it right as well. 10 points, two threes, um, another two two blocks in that one as well. So he, he's playing at a higher level at the moment, Toppin, but still probably just for deeper leagues. Well, for the Bulls, DeRozan had 31, 5, and 5, elite efficiency, 9 of 9 from the line, and Levine had 21 and 6. They really make this team go. This has been so awesome this season. We're going to get Vooch back probably in a couple more games. He is out of the protocols, but just needs to ramp it up in terms of conditioning. So he won't be back tomorrow. Lonzo, 11 points in 36 minutes, and Caruso, only four assists with no steals. A rough night from him, but I still think he's a 12-team league guy. Kobe White finally looked good, 21 minutes, 14 points, three threes. At best, I think he's going to be like a 14-team league guy. I don't think there's enough playing time or shots for him to push into the 12-team league discussion, but this was solid. While Tony Bradley had seven and four, and uh, yeah, Javante Green's going to lose those minutes to Kobe. He played just 16 here, and Derek Jones Jr. had a block. He's, he's a defensive stats streamer. Uh, Derek, not anything, uh, not anything too much more than that. The next game was an absolute ass kicking. The Suns beat the Nuggets 126-97. There was no big chungus.
Now, last game they started Austin Rivers. This time it was Jermichael Green. Green played 25 minutes, 14, 8, and 4, while Jeff Green replacing Michael Porter had 19 points in 30 minutes. They're just deeper league streams. We have no idea when Porter or Jokic are going to be back, unfortunately. And the Nuggets have just two games this week. So I guess that's good when those guys are out, when it's only a two-game week. You're not missing a four-game week. Aaron Gordon was ejected. He had 16, 10, and 4 with two steals. So he does produce when Jokic and Porter are out. We've seen that over these last couple of games. While uh, Bones Highland again got hurt, played two minutes, sprained his ankle once more. Looks like, yeah, I would imagine a little bit of time on the shelf there. While it was just an absolute stinker from Will Barton. 10 and 5, 27% shooting, 40% from the line. Big opportunity for him when he shit the bed here. Don't do anything. Don't drop him. Don't panic. Don't anything like that. Just was a bad game. While Monty Morris had 10 points with three assists. Monty is at least at this point a 12-team league stream option. Once Porter and Jokic are back, I really don't see him as a must-roster 12-team league guy. While Faku played 27 minutes and Rivers played 28. And they were okay, but not really much as fantasy, fantasy actionable. Devin Booker brought the assists back after a couple of games where they weren't really there. 27 with seven assists and Aiton had 21 and 8 in 26. Chris Paul had 10 assists, but no steals. But finally, a good Cam Johnson game. 22 points, two steals, four triples, 23 minutes. He's been really poor to begin this year, and the shooting hasn't been there, but this was impressive. Let's hope that that can kickstart something for him. While Crowder added 15 points in Bridges, yeah, not that great. Eight points in eight shots for Mikhail. He did have a steal with four assists, so it continues to be all right, but yeah, I think probably overall a bit of a letdown. 86th ranked player this season. I think I had him 70th before the year, so he's not that far off, but the people who... Um, really ascribe, uh, ascribe to, hey, turnovers matter as more than anything else. Therefore, he's a top 40 player. We are pretty disappointed with picking him in the top 40, I would imagine. JaVale McGee, 10 and 4 in his 14 minutes. Um, yeah, he's just a streamer when you're looking for those defensive stats, not anything more than that. All right, let's go to the last game of the night. The Toronto Raptors fall to the Warriors on the road. Um, 114, sorry, 119, 104. Fred Van Vliet, Pretty good. 17 points, but again, just gigantic minutes. 39 of them. 17, 4, and 7, a steal and a block. Inefficient. While Precious Achua, the big sneeze, has 12 and 8 in 26 minutes. Good game from Precious. Really efficient from the field. Uh, hit his only free throw. I still don't think that he's anything more than a deeper league guy, but that was encouraging. While Siakam had 21 and 5, and Kem Birch still brought some defensive stats, a steal and two blocks, but just 7 and 5 and only 22 minutes. I don't believe that Birch is a 12-team league guy. Scotty Barnes. 10 points on 27% shooting is bad, as is 29% from the line. But 13 rebounds, 5 assists, 2 steals, and 2 threes is pretty solid. Um, he's still lacking in usage, and we're seeing some of the shooting foibles start to be an issue for him at the moment, but still producing at a high level. Only the 28 minutes is not great. And then we, we knew it was coming. We knew it was coming. I'm sorry. I, I, we, we just knew it was coming. No! 11 points, 19%, two rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks. This, this is why I said I don't believe in Gary Trent, is he had so many of these games where if the shot didn't fall, he did nothing else. Now, this year, it's been a different story. He's been getting assists occasionally, sky-high steals, the shots have been going in, and then he brings up old Gary Trent. Let's hope we don't get a few of these in a row, but this, just so you know that I'm not a complete moron, and I said, hey, this guy's useless, this is why, because he would have these one every two games and his overall numbers would be dreadful. And that hasn't happened this year. It's just bad to see those that rear its head. It gives you like traumatic flashbacks to, oh my God, shithouse Gary Trent is back. Let's see where that goes. Not a good game. Jordan Poole was amazing. 31 minutes, 33 points, eight triples, 77% shooting. Clay Thompson is going to be back. I don't know what the hell that means for Poole. His role is going to decrease, but this was great. He is quite inconsistent. Um, and we saw two games ago how much he struggled, but two games in a row, absolutely massive. While Andrew Wiggins, 32 points, six triples, seven rebounds, three assists. Apparently, you can have revenge games against teams that you didn't even play for, as he does. He always plays well against the Raptors. Of course, he is from uh, Canada. Draymond had 14 rebounds, eight assists, and Steph, not his best night. In fact, it was shocking for him. 12 points on 20% with eight assists, and Otto Porter, one of his best games, 15 in 22 minutes with five threes with Otto Porter, uh, with uh, Andre Iguodala out. Uh, John Kaminga reduced just to garbage time and only four minutes for Nemanja Bielitsa. It's going to be hard for Bielitsa to have an impact, especially uh, when Blunty comes back. James Wiseman, um, yeah, 11 points for Chris Chiotta. Interesting 
sort of fact that the fact that he plays for this team is interesting. Not much else to really look at. Ke uh, Kevon Looney had two steals and two blocks. Did go to the locker room late, but came back and sat on the bench. Didn't get back into the game because, of course, it was um, yeah, pretty pretty high up. in or the, the margin was pretty high. That's what I'm trying to say because I, I used to be able to speak English, unfortunately. I've lost that ability. Let's look at the lines of the night. Now, monstrous line of the night goes to... Anthony Davis. He was an absolute monster. There's no debate in that. Waiver wire line of the night is MC Hamadou Diallo. The young gun of the night is Cade Cunningham. And the dud of the night I tell a man's not hot. is the diseased scrotum, Evan Fournier. Let's look at the top performers now for category leagues for today. Uh, number one is Anthony Davis. Two was DeRozan. Three was Wiggins. Four was Poole. Five was Randall. Six, the burner, Jalen Brunson. Seven was the Beatle, Paul George. Russell Westbrook, DeAndre Ayton. And then Hamadou Diallo. In terms of guys who are available in more than 50% of leagues, we're looking at Diallo. That's just a deeper league ad. Jermichael Green, maybe as a streamer if Jokic misses, but they play again on a, on a high-volume day. Frank Jackson, I wouldn't worry. Obi Toppin, watch him in deep leagues. Cam Johnson, nothing to see. Otto Porter, nothing really to see either. Kevon Looney, good game, but not buying into it. Luke Kennard, short-term 12-team ad for sure. Precious Achua, watch it, but just have him as a 16-team league guy. And then Corey Joseph, as long as Killian Hayes is out, there might be some value in him. And then on to the points leagues. Top 10 players in points leagues we've got today. Anthony Davis, Russell Westbrook, DeMar DeRozan, Jeremy Grant, Andrew Wiggins, Julius Randle, Cade Cunningham, Christos Porzingis, Jalen Brunson, and Paul George. That will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you're here on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. Leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.